Well, as many of you know, I love the weather because I firmly believe, and I've had experience going back for 30 years, that when the weather is in its prime and doing its best, and when there are certain weather factors that take place, then mature bucks are on their feet. And I love the weather. I mean, so it doesn't matter if it's hot weather, cold weather, extreme weather, all play a part in what a white, when a whitetail moves, and especially as it relates to a mature buck. Now, there'll be people that say, nah, the weather doesn't, uh, push him to move, you should just sit on your stand all the time. What the weather does to me is it you're not really focused on the distance that a mature buck travels, you're focusing on when and the timing he travels. For example, you might have a mature buck that's hitting a certain food source a half hour after dark every single day, hour after dark. Well then you get that cold front that comes through, he's still bedding in the same spot, he's still feeding in the same spot in the afternoon. It's not that he's putting on miles more because of that cold front, it's just the fact that he moves 15 minutes before dark. So you get a shot at him, a half hour before dark, even an hour before dark. Also, when cold weather comes through and deer feed five, five times in a 24 hour period, then there's many times where deer, and I'm thinking about the, the not only the poor deer down in the hurricane uh, area right now, down in Florida, the Bahamas, moving up the coast, but think about the deer in those areas too. So. Um, those deer might not feed for three days, two days. Uh, some of the deer have died and you know, they're in flooded areas. And so think about that, when that weather comes through, then those deer are going to be on their feet feeding as soon as they can. They've missed quality feedings and they're gonna be out there. So the weather to me plays a key role, not only influencing the extremities of weather. For example, doesn't take much to imagine that if you have a blizzard, if you have severe thunderstorms, if you have 60 mile an hour winds, yeah, deer might move, but the chances are extremely low, and certainly in, a, in the case of a hurricane. So if you look at the extremities, they're not going to move in certain cases. And then if there's excessive heat, they may or may not move. And, and then also, they're missing feeding opportunities. So I want to talk about in this vid video, using the weather to predict when whitetails are going to move during excessive heat and why and when you would hunt certain locations because of that excessive heat and what that makes a whitetail do. Again, the weather influences to me everything they do and even to the point where they may do something different, not only when there's cold weather, cold fronts, wind change, blizzards, but also when it heats up. Hunting extreme heated and overheated whitetails is one of the chapters, chapter seven, in my All Weather Whitetails book that I published in wrote in uh, November of 2018, so it's not very old. And so I encourage you to check that book out. It talks about every facet of the weather and how you can use it to predict when whitetails move. And chapter seven is about overheated whitetails. Now, overheated whitetails, there's five conditions and five strategies, five tips that I believe when the going gets hot that you can turn to certain stand locations and experience a much higher level of success. The first place I look and we have a stand location that relates, two stand locations relate to movements to, the, to a corner field that we have, is hunting those shady corner locations of a food plot or an ag field as those deer are coming out into that food plot. It's 80 degrees. They're coming out into that shaded portion, whether it's by hill or by trees. They'll come into that corner. And that's something that you can watch. You know, I used to watch deer in the 80s and 90s, lawn chair, pop chips. Uh, side of a road or ditch system, side of a cornfield, and watch those deer come out in the thumb of Michigan, um, out into the uh, soybeans and alfalfa fields, and really paid attention to where they're coming at, where we could get a good luck at them with our cheap little binoculars we had at the time. And uh, now we're blessed with the Vortex binoculars, high-end quality glass, and complete different. But we had to get close to them, and we were in those shady sides or near the shady sides because that's where they'd enter the food, food plot or the, in that case, the ag fields in the late 80s, early 90s. And that was a consistent area where we could watch them all summer long. And that pattern repeated itself into the end of September and into October after the October opener as we were looking for locations to hunt in the evening where those mature bucks, at that time, the mature bucks were two and three year old, three year olds at the most. Um, where they are coming into the field. So that's point number one, really hunt the shady corner. That temperature can often be several degrees, 10 degrees or more in difference than out, right out in the direct sunlight where, like where I'm standing right now. One of the things that I can't stress enough, this crab apple tree has accounted for 
10, 12 shots over the last few years. Um, Diane shot her first deer here at Doe. Uh, Sam shot his first deer here at Doe with the crossbows. And Dante and Jake have had countless opportunities at, uh, with their vertical bows here and crossbow. Uh, we have a stand right there. We have a redneck ghillie blind right there. We're actually removing that stand in favor of the ghillie blind because we feel like we can get into an, an out even um, easier than, uh, than coming up the hill and then having to climb a stand. So remote soft mass. If you're planting apple trees, if you're planting crab apple trees, any kind of fruit tree, um, make sure you're planting it by a bow stand. That's no different than a water hole. You're putting a water hole out there and it's not by a bow stand. That's a sin in my book and that's the same with with um, soft mass. So remote soft mass areas that you can put a bow stand by. It might be on the way between bedding and feeding to a food source. It might be on the corner of a food plot and you're actually hunting in the woods where you can get in and out without spooking the deer, but they're all headed towards that crab apple or apple on the way there. We have an apple tree right down here that we have had a uh, camera on the last couple of years that gives us outstanding footage of bucks coming in and out of that. We already have a monster that's hitting that this year um, in the early season. So having these food these uh, fruit bearing trees next to bow stands where you can get in and out with spooking them. A nice little hidden corner, remote corner, maybe a wooded area between uh, bedding and, and food source. I do not encourage you to put these out in the middle of the woods because if they're in the middle of the woods, then you, in, in theory you could have a buck that gets out of his bed, he hits the apple tree, feeds on until dark, that's his third feeding of the day and you never get to see him outside of that wooded area. Why do they hit the soft mast? Moisture lots of moisture in these little crab apples. And when they're thirsty, they can come hit these crab apples, hit that apple tree behind me a couple hundred yards away. And that supplies their daily moisture needs. That's all they need to do to take a drink. They literally do not have to drink, take a drink out of water. There's no water on this property or anywhere near. And so they can come hit these crab apple trees and, um, and then move on and that meets their moisture requirement. I just did remember we do have one water hole over that way but on this side of the property there's no water and they don't come all the way over here go back and forth to the water and so soft mass can meet the requirements for thirsty hot white tails during the preseason early season great camera location that we have here and um, another way to make sure that you can hunt overheated white tails now there's a lot of opportunity for hunting bedding areas whether it's during the rut or even in the early season where you have long movements where you're able to come into a back door, into a bedding area and wait for deer uh, to come, come back to you. I think I was watching, uh, I don't watch a lot of hunting shows, but uh, Mike Pelletier with Hardcore Pursuits, I saw on Instagram the other day, they did just that. They had a bachelor group of bucks, they're a half mile out in the field. They got into the stand a half or an hour early and then waited for them to come back. And sure enough, he shot the oldest buck in there, a monster eight points. So that was just a few days ago uh, here in early September. So very, good tactic heavily shaded areas but certainly creek ravines creek bottoms anywhere with water the shady side of a hill really if it's sun exposed and hot whether it's the rut early season october lull you can bet that those white tails if it's a hot day especially if they're cruising and especially if they're just sitting all day lazily during the during october or early september those early days they're going to find that shady side shady woodlot good airflow and whether you're hunting thick areas that are shaded out during the rut, creek bottoms that are shaded out and cooler because of the water and because of the elevation change, or you're hunting in shaded timber with good airflow, those are three hot spots, depending on if you're hunting in the rut or September and October, that you can find mature bucks that want to get out of the heat and find a place to lay up during the day and that bedding area might be completely different than it gets in from early season to the rut, but same conditions, they can get out of the heat, whether low in thick brush on a shady side or in a cool wood lot that's shaded with good airflow. Now, point number four, and this is something that's really important that I talk about all the time, is that I go to big properties that have corn and bean rotations, and when it gets into November, December, there's not a lot of moisture in those corn or beans at all. But if you have big green food plots and big green food sources with plants that hold a lot of moisture, for example, brassica, brassica plants can be 80% moisture, then you can actually have a food source that white tails will gravitate to when it's hot because of the amount of moisture in the plants, no different than these crab apples or apples. And think about that, they can just go take a drink. 
so they can go right from their bedding areas. They're dry, hot, thirsty, and they go right to that green food source, hit it. And if you have diverse greens that last all season long, you can be the number one herd influencer. And even against the big boys with the beans and corn and huge rotations, you have some high quality green food plots off to the edge. And what I've seen many times over is that bucks and deer in general that are sitting back in dry woods, they'll come hit the green food sources. And then after dark, they take off to the ag fields and the bean and corn rotations. So I think they do that. One, it's probably their hidden food source or it's not pressured. You know, that's something you have to do all the time. But two, they're moisture laden green food sources that the deer crave when the going gets hot. And that can happen any time of the year. And guess what? They'll hit those greens every day of the year, no matter what. So they'll keep the movement even when it's hot, even when it's cold, they want to hit those greens every single day. And finally, water holes. I talk about water holes all the time. I left it for last because it seems like I cover that topic so much, but kind of imagine deer that are sitting dry. The whole reason they're going to that green food source is moisture. Add a small water hole, we use 110 gallon tanks on the way there, and guess what? They hit the water. And offers a pinpoint movement. You, we often use that water with a mock scrape in combination. We're adding a morning stand and the evening stand depending on the side of the, the water that we're hunting for different winds. And pretty cool that we can define movement from a big bedding area over here that might be 200 yards wide to a big food plot down here that goes to ag field. And we bring all the deer, a high percentage of them right through on a mock scrape in a water hole on the way to that green food source at night. And you can bet when it's really hot, when it's during the rut and, and bucks are thirsty, whether it's hot or cold, they hit that water. And it is an awesome experience to see. You can use water. You know, this all relates to deer staying cool, meeting their moisture requirements. And those are five ways that you can hunt and find success when bucks are overheated and otherwise you wouldn't think they'd be moving. And I want you to really concentrate on those five things. Uh, inside food corners, water holes, soft mass, greens, and cool bedding area hotspots. Those five areas you can concentrate, five strategies for hunting this year. And hey, by the way, if you want, check out my all-weather whitetail book. This is all related. It's chapter seven of the book. And you can use weather to successfully, highly successfully. I've been doing it for decades. My clients, my readers, my viewers have been doing it for a long time. I get incredible feedback. It is a number one predictor of mature buck movement for during the daylight, which in the end, that's obviously when we hunt. Take advantage of it.